we're going to talk about Perio. So what I want to do is, you know, I'm a chairman of the uh, Periodontal Associated Soft Tissue Committee. I'm not a periodontist, but I'm a general practitioner that has special interest in managing soft tissue. So our committee, you know, our, our mission of the Periodontal Soft Tissue Committee of the IAMT, you know, is to promote, educate practitioners, emerging biologic therapies in Perio, and therapies that are safe, effective, and biologically based. So with that out of the way, let's continue. So what are our goals today? Our goals really, once again, to give the position of the IAMT in relationship to periodontal and soft tissue care, but also I want to get into some really good stuff about integrating different type of therapies into managing the soft tissue, uh, which is really the key element as far as our practices are concerned. It's the, really the foundation of what we do. So, of course, what we want to do is think out of the box, okay? If you're into the biologic world, how many uh, biologic type dentists we have here? We're emerging into the biologic world, which is awesome, okay? That's good. Some colleagues right here. So, of course, if you're into that biologic world, which is really becoming huge in the dental field itself, you know, you have to think out of the box a little bit. You've got to think, first of all, very differently, which is a very, very good thing. So, we always want to think in an integrative biologic manner, meaning that in the integrative world, we take all types of therapies, allopathic, you know, natu naturopathic, osteopathic, herbal, all these type of things, and, you know, assess the patient and what is best for the patient. Bring all those different components together to serve what the patient's specific needs are itself. So, you know, let's see the forest from the trees, but we do love the trees themselves. So we'll build our story from there. We love those trees. So let's talk about biocompatible periodontal disease control. Okay, the official recommendations of the IOMT once we get the official recommendations out of the IMT, then we can move on to the fun stuff, okay? But it's interesting, you know, you look back historically, you know, the, the evolution of periodontal, managing periodontal things. Remember the old term pyorrhea? Who remembers pyorrhea? Oh, my God, you know. You have pyorrhea. Oh, my God. And eczema or seborrhea. Remember those things? Okay. Well, we look at those differently. Well, we go back in time. You know, in the 1800s, you know, Willoughby, you know, talked about different things. Move my glass around so I can see. Talked about things. Oops. Uh oh. Uh oh. This is supposed to put a prison with in my pocket. Won't harm me, will it? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's rough up here. Let me tell you something. Okay. So anyhow, going back to eighteen hundreds, they always think about this concept of chemoparasitic and parasites in your mouth. Okay, big deal. All right, we move along in time. Nineteen twenties, the bacterial theory came about, you know, because scientists couldn't detect any bacterial difference between you know, uh, between health and pyorrhea. And you know, every case of pyorrhea alveolitis began by irritation, you know, probably from us more than anything, or once again, hygiene concepts there. But it really boils down over the years. I mean, we have different concepts, you know. Basically, as our science approves and proves and proves, it's bacteria. But now we know it's interesting. We're going to study, matter of fact, on water hygiene in the dental office. So I'm speaking to uh, the scientists over UNLV and the water department over in, uh, in Las Vegas. So we're talking about the microbiology department. And it says, was it true, and I read this, that we really only know less than 1% of all the microbes of the world. And it's true. We know very, very little because the only way you know about microbes is you grow them and identify them. So when we harvest things, we try to figure out, if you remember, I'm sure most of you do, we talk about, you know, microbiology in relation to oral cavity. When I started dental school a couple of years ago, okay, back in uh, 79, 83, we graduated, it's like there are five bacteria in the oral cavity. Okay, good. A few years later, maybe there's 10 or 20. Years later, maybe there's 100. We don't know what the hell we're growing because, once again, your oral cavity as well as your microbiome itself, which is a popular term these days, is really unique to each and every one of you. And remember, stepping ahead a little bit, 
90% of you is what? Bacteria. 10% is this. We're not talking about size. We're talking about numbers. So when you think about it, okay, thinking biologically, etc., what have we been doing for the last, what, since what, the, the 1930s till now? Trying to what, kill what, 90% of ourselves? So by trying to kill 90% of us with all this antibiotics and overuse of antibiotics, okay, we're paying the price today. Where the era of the antibiotic is almost to pretty much end, okay? But I think hopefully we're being a little more stringent with that. So as the history of peri periodontal care came about, they're trying to think of what the hell is causing it. Why are we seeing bone damage? And we came to realize, and we'll review this again, as about, you know, 1960s, this non-specific plaque theory, whatever the heck that really means, non-specific plaque theory, okay? Until ultimately, you know, the specific, now it's a specific uh, plaque theory. So we don't know what it is, then we think we know what it is, until ultimately back in what? up the date again back in 86 just a couple of years ago we really came to understand in a more clear coherent way is that okay we have these type of bacteria or whatever fungus virus who knows what the hell you grow okay but it's the body's response to that irritant that does the destruction so as we get into this a little bit further we'll come to realize is that the destruction comes from what the immune response when you think about the bacteria, is it following me? I'm good, thank you. I know I'm better, a wise guy. So, now he broke my trend of thought. What happened, oh, where was I? Yes. Thank you very much. So, when we come to realize that ultimately, maintaining your periodontium, okay, and the clean, is keeping your mouth clean. How many do all this beautiful prosthetics all this amazing stuff, and then the patient disappears. They come back a few years later, it's destroyed. It's been overgrown. It's not maintained. It boils down to ultimately hygiene itself. So when you talk about disease prevalence, you know, it's an interesting thing about periodontal disease. It's everywhere. What's the problem with periodontal disease when we talk about that as far as prevalence is concerned itself? It's a communicable disease. You know, years ago, a friend of mine said to me, he says, Phil, this periodontal disease is communicable. I said, okay, from wives, lovers, and dogs. I said, dogs? I said, what is this guy into? Okay. Hmm, the dog thing. But I have the answer to that. So, you know, it's a band of testing we'll talk about. It's kind of an enzyme test that gives you a sense of the virility of the bacteria. But, you know, listen. As parents, we screw our kids up, but we can give them also, we can give them periodontal disease and share our bacteria with them, of course. All right. And, you know, the oral cavity is theoretically, the child is sterile. And uh, when they exit the body, and then, of course, once again, their microbiome is dictated by their, the way they're born. Vaginal birthing, different microflora from a C-section itself. Once again, periodontal disease is communicable, communicable through a saliva itself. Now, of course, if you're walking, you're still, you know, if you're part of the walking dead, you can still suck face. And, you know, there's millions and millions and millions of bacteria that are exchanged during the kissing effect, okay? And it can be 80 millions, millions of bacteria, whether they become a micro niche within your oral cavity, that remains to be seen based on your immune response and its ability to attach. And remember, for bacteria to be effective against you, they actually have to attach and live in this biofilm, which we'll discuss in a couple of minutes. What was fun was I finally figured out or found out what the story with the dog thing was. So this all started back in Sweden when these two kids wound up with this weird form of periodontal disease. They couldn't figure out what the heck that was all about. Well, as it turned out, that these kids, they did you know, genetic testing on the patients, on the parents themselves, testing around. Well, what was happening was that the children, these two kids, had got puppies from the same litter. And I guess they were doing mmm, 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 kissy puppy stuff, and they contracted their bacteria infection from the dogs themselves. So 
thank you kids for sucking face with a dog. And the moral of that story really is, you don't want to suck face with something that looks like that. Oh. And there's Henry, or that. There we go. Where's, there we go. Uh, there we go. That's our Easter, Easter bully itself. Nasty looks. She used to chew on Henry. We had we voted actually Darla off the island. She had to go with my daughter of New York State. Anyhow, so the prevalence of periodontal disease. How do we really measure how much periodontal disease in the world? How many patients come in, have some form of perio, have no idea why is it so prevalent? Okay, and no one addresses it. The vast majority of people don't even address it. Why? You don't feel it. It's like any chronic disease itself. You know, we're dealing in it. We're kind of in a different world today where we're dealing with things that tend to be more chronicity to it. And the problem with chronic disease is that it's slow. They slowly creep up on you. You don't realize it. I just say, listen, years ago, I used to run an oral facial program. And the patients would come in and their headaches, jaws, this and that. And I'd say, you know, that says your jaws aren't working, yeah, because they always have a cervical problem. And so I said, okay, stand nice and straight, okay. I says, well, how's your neck feel? Oh, it's perfectly fine. Oh, really? Okay. I said, okay, you know, what I want you to do is just, you know, turn, turn your head from me. Right? I said, wait a minute. Stand straight. Up. Oh, problem is these things are slow and insidious. That's periodontal disease. How many patients come in and you start pocket probing, you're having all these different pockets, his teeth are actually wiggling around a little bit, and they're like totally oblivious to it. They don't feel it. When did he feel it? Oh, my Saturday night. Oh, my God. They're all swollen. That's when they feel it. That's the problem with the prevalence. So all kinds of studies were done, natural studies, how many people have it, don't have it. You know what? We don't really know. We don't really know. And it's just how you measure it and how you maintain that, okay? So we try to educate our patients, you know. We love doing prosthetics. Oh, I love it. Oh, beautiful bridge work. We do implants, all this stuff. But the bottom line is, if the patients don't maintain it, okay, it has no value. They can spend all kinds of thousands. I tell the patients, I love doing this bridge work. It looks beautiful. Your veneers, oh, this is fantastic. But if you don't maintain it and come back and see us on a regular basis, okay, so if there's an issue, we can deal with it, you know, you're wasting your money. You're wasting your money because of the slow, insidious nature of what we call periodontal disease. So we can educate them like crazy, okay? More education, I'm not sure what that means. In our practice, I practice with my dear wife, and so she handles all the perio part. So it's great when I hear her doing the mommy routine on guys that are 50 years old. You hear a couple of slaps going on that they're not maintaining their stuff properly, okay? So if they get out of control, I send them to dear Karen, and she straightens them right out, that's for sure. So education is important, okay? And what's important is that we are all infected. We are all infected. But it's the nature of that infection, okay, that dictates whether we're going to wind up with an immune response that's going to create that bone destruction, the supporting structures themselves. So with the etiology, it really breaks down to you have a pathogenic microflora. And what does a pathogenic microflora really mean? Well, really, a pathogenic microflora is an evolutionary concept where you have. Let me step back one quick question. This advantage that we have when you're talking about microflora bacteria is they have the greatest propensity and easily can switch genes on and off. Mammal cells are very slow. They have a hard time, unless we poison them or do something dopey to them, to change things, to change the genetics. Bacterial forms can switch them on and off like nothing, and they change. I don't know if you heard about the concept of what's called, from a doctor called Enderline, pleomorphism. You know, where do they, all these bugs change? All of a sudden we have everything. As the ecology, like the ecology of the oral cavity changes, where, once again, they're undisturbed, oxygen partial pressure changes, things are changing to become more anaerobic, 
they start to evolve and change into things that are adapted to that ecology. So we're really talking, when we talk about pathogenic microflora, we're talking things that evolve over time into more pathogenic stuff. And now what does pathogenic mean? Well, it's the poop and pee they produce, that's getcha. It's the metabolic byproducts or exotoxins or endotoxins that they produce that does the poisoning to us. So you have pathogenic microflora, susceptibility of a host. Okay, what does susceptibility mean? Anyone. Anyone susceptible to these changes itself. And disease prevalence, you know, some of the studies show 75% disease prevalence caused by genetic mutations. The genetic mutations occur at the microbial level as the environment, the ecology changes itself. Okay? So they talk about genetic, you know, highly unlikely. That's on the human scale, on the bacterial scale. Vastly changes rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. An obliging host, an obliging host is anyone that leaves this microflora undisturbed. Undisturbed. And the result where the damage comes in is on that immune response itself. So while pathogenic bacteria you know, initiate the inflama inflammation itself, as we know, the body's responding to this, okay? It's the immune response itself that ultimately does the destruction. And it's kind of an interesting thing which we'll touch on in a couple of minutes. So if you look at healthy versus periodontal disease, healthy is what you, know, you tend to see more aerobes, love oxygen, love oxygen. You don't see a lot of white blood cells because the immune response hasn't been initiated itself. And those horrible spirochetes, we talk about spirochetes. Oh my goodness, where do those spirochetes come from, okay? And the biofilm is non multiple just kind of sit there, it's beautiful, floating around, everybody's happy. And it's important that we understand, and we'll touch this again, is that we need good biofilm. That's where the bugs live. They just don't hang out. They live in this beautiful biofilm. There's a lot of positive exchanges that go on because the bacteria, good solid bacteria, good biofilm or good probiotic type of microflora is critically important for our health and wellness. We cannot survive as sterile individuals. It just does not work that way. We talk about this, this ease state itself, things change. Where we're seeing more gram-negative types, which is testing methodology, more oxygen-hating bacteria, then we start to see the immune response. Remember, this is also, the pH is shifting also. In the oral cavity, you know, the oral, the oral cavity, what should the pH be like? It should be much more alkaline, right? About 6.8. There's a methodology for that, okay? When we start digestive process, where it starts in the oral cavity of cell, with our pH about 20, what really goes on for us when the saliva comes rolling in? It's bringing enzymes in. The initiation of digestion starts in the oral cavity. What do we break down in the oral cavity? Sugars and fats. And remember that when we start breaking those down, those lipase and amylase, all enzyme systems are what? pH dependent. So if you have a heavily infected mouth, your digestive process right from the beginning is going to change unto itself. So that's why we like an alkaline environment, not a heavily infected acidic environment cell. And we start to see spirochetes. Where the hell does the spirochetes come from? All of a sudden you have spirochetes. You catch them, or once again, is this a pleomorphic concept, whereas the ecology changes things start to change and adapt also at the same time, ecological shifting. And there's a lot of activity, highly mobile type of biofilm itself. So with the non-pathic biofilms, you know, we see predominantly gram-positive aerobes. I want you to memorize all these forms for the quiz before you leave today. And a few white blood cells, the immune response. This is a happy, healthy biofilm, which is compatible to health and maintenance of the uh, health of the oral cavity itself. When you get into pathogenic forms, they tend to become more gram-negative aerobes. The Saransky red group is a testing methodology, but this is when things start to get nasty. Things start to change. The oxygen levels are starting to change. More acid, acid-loving microbes are coming in itself and changing, okay? And also fungus. There's fungus amongst us. What's one of the biggest sources of fungus in the oral cavity, other than maybe your gut? Sometimes root canals. Root canals, you know, it's one thing we did a lot of studies with ozone and root canals. And the one thing that I learned years ago, which I never was taught, 
the amount of fungus that inundated some root canals. Not all, but some, but some itself. And of course, this is where we get the uh, infiltration of the immune response itself. And these just become nastier and nastier itself. So what is bacteria biofilms? This has become very popular, the concept of biofilms itself. Well, it certainly is, uh, isn't your lunch. Everybody flossed and brushed their uh, teeth today after lunch? I hope so. What? Okay, there you go. So the concept of plaque. Remember plaque, one of the first things the freshman dental student, you stain your mouth nice and red. Of course, you're out partying the night before. Oh, my God, look at that plaque in there. Well, now we call it biofilm, the biofilm itself, okay? So that becomes a little passe itself. So when you talk about biofilms itself, you know, the correct term, once again, is biofilm. So it's interesting that these bugs, they get well organized. They're smart. They know what to do. They can change in the environment changes. They get organized. They speak the same language, cytokinese, right? Cytokine language. They have built condos. They, they have high rises. They have pathways, rows. They're not stupid. They're not stupid, okay? They're well always, and you're well outnumbered by them themselves, okay? So they twitch around, move around, they get organized, they hang on to each other so they don't get lost in that biofilm itself. But then they produce that biofilm itself. And that they draw out proteins, polysaccharides, different structural components from the extracellular matrix in and around the curricular fluids themselves and the epithelial cells. And everybody should be well informed about the extracellular matrix that interface between the cells and the vascular and lymphatic system itself. So as this form, this, this beautiful, nice, wet, dark area in the oral cavity starts to form, that biofilm's coming in, and it's changing. Oxygen drops, starting to drop down and becoming more acidic, and things are starting to become crazier and crazier down there. So there are a few pathogens going on. And what happens, the neighborhoods, well, we're not too crowded, you know, things are feeling good, we got plenty of food, but then a critical mass occurs. Too many, there's too many of us. There's not enough room for all of us. What are we gonna do? We're gonna start going berserker. We're gonna start producing weird toxins, okay? We're gonna start trying to kill off our friends. I love my neighbors, but you're too close to me. I'm gonna start producing poisons that will knock you down and sell. That's called quorum sensing. They'll send out chemicals. That's the language of the body, molecular signaling. And what happens? You hit a threshold and things start to change. They start switching their genes on and off. They start producing those toxins. And when those toxins are produced, they start hijacking the immune system. These are hijacking the immune system. What's going to happen initially is all those white blood cells, those macrophages, neutrophils are going to come in, they clean up but then these toxins actually poison them and they start acting in dopey ways to the advantage of those bacteria. So the neutrophils and macrophages certainly start, you know, killing off their friends. But also what's very interesting is that by poisoning the immune system, the immune system cells of neutrophils, macrophages, those, in, those scouts out there coming in, they go through early apoptosis. And what happens is the enzyme systems within those white blood cells spills into this curricular biofilm. And what it does is starts to break up the, the junctions of epithelial cells that line the curricular, line the pocket itself. And you listen, epithelial cells, we love epithelial cells. Epithelial cells love themselves. They love to hold together their beautiful little barriers. They cuddle each other. They hold each other, protects us. But these enzyme systems actually break open that and allow for what? Infiltration into the tissue itself. And this is where we see this kind of this oral systemic concept where the epithelial barrier is broken down. It's like leaky gut. Everybody familiar with leaky gut syndrome? It's a similar thing, but in the oral cavity. It allows for these pathogenic forms to infiltrate into the system itself. These are not stupid things, that's for sure. Of course, dental biofilm, okay? We used to call dental plaque. And the beauty of it, it's, it's greatly resistant. With this film around them, you can't get the, the antibiotics get in. So the trick is, okay, 
is that for us to manage these things on an antibacterial level, these things have to get through the biofilm down to those forms themselves. And now I want you to hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, get your popcorn ready because you will now see the formation of Bill Virtue's biofilm. It's right back there. This is work that's done at University of Montana. They have an almost whole department dedicated to uh, biofilm studies. But it amazes me the capability of these microbes to form these colonies, to change and mature. We can keep them happy and healthy and support a probiotic, pro-life, or we can allow them to fester and change and turn those weird machines on that eventually just really poison us and wear us down. Now, where do the spirochetes come from? Well, this is this study is done oh probably about I think about eighteen hours or so. So as the partial pressure, the oxygen, the oxygen environment's changing, becoming more anoxic, basically more anaerobes, they're changing, and we're seeing para, you know spirochetes come in. Where do they come in? They just jump in? No, pleomorphic changes adapting to the ecology as it changes. The bacteria have this great capacity. We're switching genes on and off in a very quick manner to adapt to the environment that they are in. Kiss me, you fool. Oh, look at this. Wow. I'll teach you to brush and floss. Let's move on a little. So, you know, in healthy biofilms, you know, it's really quiescent. The bacteria are in there, they're not too crowded, they're not really poisoning us. But, you know, there's a certain dynamic to that. It has a great curricular flow. It flows around nurturing teeth. There's a lot of studies showing that elements, a lot of positive things come from a healthy biofilm and the curricular fluid itself, okay? Nutrients in to support the periodontium, et cetera. So a healthy, you know, healthy, happy pair of biofilm in the corvicular fluids is a good thing, but it can change into a negative area as we can do what we've seen. So, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, we clean their oral cavity up, you're in there doing your hygiene, you clean them all up, beautiful, they go home, it's a few stray bacteria around, but it's amazing how rapidly they can change. You know, we think about antibiotic risks, and we're seeing things like Marcons, all these things you're hearing about today. So what the hell is all going on? There are all this resistant bacteria. So, you know, things can change. Let me go back, see if I get that picture going again. So, this is how rapidly bacteria can change themselves over. So, when you talk about antibiotic resistant bacterial forms, Listen, you can kill millions of them, but there's a few of that for whatever genetic reason is resistant to that antibacteria, that antibiotic, boom, you have a whole flora associated with that that is resistant. And we're seeing that in more and more patients, to be honest with you. Okay? So the trick here is once again, you know, this disruption of the biofilm and that ecosystem, keeping, you know, the basis for a perio in my mind is, is something simplistic in a way. Keeping that biofilm at what I call an immature state, okay, a more oxygenated state, tends to arrest the issue. What we don't want to do is leave things undisturbed. I guess it goes back to maintaining depth, pocket depth, etc., and using all our tools to maintain that maturity level of the biofilm itself. If we keep the biofilm at an immature state, there's no chance of pathogenic changes itself. So, once again, those biofilms can come back in a few days, and they're consistent with the, the uh, disruption and effect of the disease control itself. So, you talk about the significance, you got periodontal disease, you have that tissue invasion itself, okay, and there's a reservoir for infection because we clean it up, the, the infection's in the tissue itself, and I'll show you some tricks to get rid of that, and this is where 
ultimately, we see that uh, oral systemic, the systemic disease. And, you know, it's interesting. We talk about cardiovascular disease related to periodontal disease, et cetera. Cardiovascular disease is not a cholesterol issue, by the way. Okay. Cholesterol is what? Low-grade antioxidant. It's like a Band-Aid. It's the chronic inflammation created by infections, let's say in the oral cavity in the body in general, that creates that problem itself, chronic inflammation. So we talk about systemic disease associations itself, You've got periodontal disease, and we know this for a fact. We see this in the literature again and again and again, osteoporosis, adverse pregnancy, diabetes, low birth weights, peripheral artery disease. So we can see the far-reaching effects. And this is the beauty of where you are in dentistry itself, in the biologic world and in the general traditional dentistry world. We really have a huge, huge impact on the overall health and wellness of our patients, just by even maintaining periodontion and other issues, which are much deeper for another time. So really, the, the literature has been showing more and more that it's really the immune response that does the destructive end but what's important is it's thinking about biologically, thinking about ecologically, how to manage the oral cavity itself. So the review, it's biofilm, it's not black. All biofilms aren't pathogenic. It depends, to me, on the level of the maturity of that biofilm itself. Periodontal disease, it's an inflammation that does the damage itself, okay? Periodontal disease and risk of systemic medical inflammation microbiology of the health and disease are different, okay? But interesting enough, weird cases we're seeing today. We're seeing things are differently. You know, things are changing. The ecology of things are changing. Years ago, even with implants itself, things are changing. Years ago, you know, when uh, my dear partner and I put implants in, we go back to the days of the core event where basket-type implants, uh, you know, blade implants, which are insane, subperiosteal implants, I mean, you could almost take a rusty nail and like tap it in somebody's jaw and it would integrate. Today, we're seeing different things going on. Different things, the implants, it's peri-implantitis. Where the hell did that all come from all of a sudden? Okay, where do all these weird things come from? We're seeing this in periodontia. You see patients come in and gums look good. Your pocket probe, hmm, what's going on? You see this progression of bone loss. What's going on here? Well, what's happening is, and this is just one factor, there's many factors involved, but fluorinated pharmaceuticals. There are hundreds of pharmaceutical agents today that have fluoride attached to the, to the tail end. But so Celebrex, you're talking about anti-anxieties, you know, antifungals, appetite suppressants, okay, steroids, antidepressants. I mean, you know, you have your patients come in, they have their list of their medications, 18, you know, 18, 20 different medications. You take a look at them. A lot of them have fluoride attached to them. And, you know, we've had people in the pharmaceutical world, you know, come to our practice as patients and stuff like that. I says, well, you know, why do you add these things? Well, we think it makes things go better. Fluoride, they add arsenic, bromide, all these things onto these molecular structures. And what happens is you take a look structurally, like at Celebrex. Ah, oh, Celebrex, I like it, okay? Well, except the fact that they attach a fluoride to it. Why? Uh, I don't know, okay? But when these things break down, go through the liver, through the phases of things. Remember, the liver, what it's trying to do, it's trying to get things more soluble. It starts to cleave up the molecule itself. And guess what? You're getting fluoride poisoning every day. You may be happy, but you're getting fluorinated at the same time, okay? So those are the kind of subtle things you have to look at today when you're seeing different kind of weird, bizarre periodontal conditions. It's not strictly bacterial anymore. We're dealing environmentally. We're dealing with you know, different type of chemical issues that are, to, are leaking, leaking into these patients themselves. So when you talk about diagnosis, treatment, maintenance, prevention, you know, the phases of biocompatible therapy. So what's been the standard, you know, standard care? over the time, okay? This is a typical New Jersey patient that comes in. So we talk about risk assessment, or what a risk assessment, their past medical history, what they do, did they smoke, did they drink, you know, did they traumatic events, et cetera. So we look at risk, what's going on with their cell. You know, profies, yeah, we love them, okay? Home care, et cetera, education, did they keep their teeth clean, 
okay? What, what level of home care do they really do? And that's the amazing thing. If they don't do their homework, when you think about it, okay, think about this. Typical periodontal patient, you want to call them that. You see them, what, every three months. Typical model, every three months. Who made that up? Some toothpaste company made three months. It's a great time, okay? They come in every three months. You see them for what? Maybe a hygienist or you. See them for a half hour, maybe an hour if you're having a good time. Okay, so you see them for maybe four hours a year. It's what they do with those other nine gazillion hours the rest of the year that counts. And you know, something screws up. Oh, oh, the dentist did it to me. Right? What did you do to me? My teeth fell out. What the hell have you been doing in between those four hours? I saw you for the whole year. So, yeah, so we try to maintain maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. You know, in our practice, we got rid of that three and six month thing. Everybody needs something different. If some patients need to come in every couple of months, get their teeth cleaned. You know, and sometimes, you know, I'm talking to a patient, and I turn around, you know, I'm talking, and I look at their chart. Man, I haven't seen you for a year, but everything looks beautiful. Someone I haven't seen for three months. What the hell happened? So, you know, education, we hope, but it's ultimately, ultimately, especially in our, our biologic model, you know, we talk about the healing concept, okay? We want to, dental healing, etc. The beautiful thing, we can put help the patient, we can do we take perio care, beautiful prosthetics, everything else, but ultimately the patients have to take responsibility for themselves. Especially if they get into more chronic disease states, they can only heal, patient can only heal themselves. We can help them, but ultimately, and this is important when you get into different biologics, patients come in, we call it the land of the woo-woo sometimes they come in, okay? Ultimately, they have to heal themselves. We can support that healing process, but if they don't take the onus onto themselves of healing, nothing really will help them for sure. If we, you know, standard of care, well, microscopic analysis, which we'll touch on, some people do that. It's a great educational tool, okay? Uh, DNA analysis, that's great. Shows you all kinds of different things, but they do mana testing and Han testing. They do have their limitations. These are what I call assessments, okay? It alludes to certain situations himself. Irrigation, we can use all different crazy chemicals or ozonated water itself. Root planning and scaling, we like that. Remember from dental school, the professor would come down and take the little probe. Oh, it's, it's a little rough right there. Just smooth that off. Yeah, okay, drive you crazy. All right, they all get flashbacks from that. Supplementation. I mean, these people need, you know, supplements of some form. Okay, there's a lot of malnourished individuals out there. So good nutrition, whatever that might mean itself. You know, pocket reduction procedures. Who loves perio surgery? Everybody love perio surgery? Ooh, nasty man, nasty. You had to do that to escape dental school, and I think we had to do five or six of those. Those patient patients lost their teeth. Oh well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh my God. Anything to escape dental school. Anyhow. So frequent recall appointments, like I said, we tossed out that three and six month thing because you know what, for some patients it works, but for others, you have to really, we customize that, whatever they, what the patient really needs. Laser therapy, you know, we just brought in uh, Val Cantor speaking this weekend, okay, Val's awesome. And of course she, you know, she came to our school and of course forced me into getting one of the light walker lasers Okay, which is an awesome laser. It's unbelievable. And we're using that in our peri. I was always like, yeah, I had a diode. I wasn't much of a laser guy. But then we brought the, the light walker in. Holy cow, for perio and endo. It's, it's an absolutely amazing. So we're using that laser therapy. So I'm like that. Oxygen ozone therapy. And that's awesome. I'm going to touch on that. That's one of my favorites itself. So those are kind of, if you want to call standard of care, whatever standard of care might mean. I'm not even really, really sure. Okay. So diagnostic concepts, you know, you have cool things like the Florida Pro, but this is classic. You take a stick and stick it in the hole. Hmm, it looks kind of deep. It looks kind of that. Okay, you get an assessment from that. That gives you a relationship between the soft tissue and the bone. I'm speaking to the choir here. So we do that. And we look at things like tissue tone, you know, is it bloody? Is it purple? Is it bleeding, et cetera, you know? And, you know, all the typical stuff as far as an assessment concerned, you know. You know, stimulation, or bleeding upon stimulation, okay? We see that, you know, all the time, okay? And my favorite is odor. Odor, fermenting, 
How many patients come in are fermenting? Okay, you know it right away. Some patients are like, holy cow, unbelievable. So they're fermenting, and it's a fermentation process because remember, when things shift into that more anaerobic state, okay, where they're oxygen hating, that becomes a fermentation process, okay? Fermentation where they're burning sugars, et cetera, and the metabolic byproducts associated with that. So we look at that as far as discharge concerned, you know, reception, you know, abfractions. You know, we're from the New York metropolitan area, so everybody's abfracting, you know, like, huh, 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 okay? They're cracking their teeth, and, you know, and malocclusion, you know, doesn't really create periodontal disease, but it certainly can contribute and progress it by having a uh, malocclusion itself. And then, of course, you know, connective tissue destruction, bone loss. We see eventual migra apical migration of the bone, the tissue itself. We see, you know, the cortical bone tend to change. So it is a combination of things. It really never is like a thing that creates this loss of bone and attachment. So what we're really battling is really, when you think about it, we're really working on, okay, how do we stabilize the bone? How do we keep the bone healthy, okay? How do we keep the periodontium, that suspension ligament, healthy and maintain that foundation of that tooth itself in the socket? Now, it's kind of like, kind of like implantology. Does an implant fail or does the bone fail? It's the bone that really fails around the implant itself. We'll say the implant fails. Well, it's the bone around it that fails. So we can do all kinds of cool testing, okay? Great testing, but like I said, it, to me, these are more assessment concepts than anything. And the IOMT, traditionally for years and years, really, you know, love the concept of face contrast microscopy. Anybody do that here at all? A little microscope? Great. I know you do. But, you know, and it's a great assessment tool. It's great. You know what's even better? This is for the patient itself. They look and they, oh my God, I got these things swimming around my head. So educationally tools, you know, it's great, you know. And, you know, it's somewhat cost effective after you spend the money for the microscope itself. It's chair side. Basically, you're taking a little curricular fluid out of there, putting on a slide and slipping under, you know, microscope itself. Got a nice TV screen. So the advantages are, you know, it's chair side. You know, the minute, you know, one minute the results are, you can see white blood cells and all that. Okay, so it's kind of cool. You see spirochetes in there. And it's a patient motivation trick. Okay, it really is. Now, once again, micro, you know, microbiologically, I mean, it's a real sliver of what really is there. Okay, but it gives you, once again, the advantages to learn how to do it and the cost of the scope itself. Okay. So it's always interesting at, you know, meetings. I've been coming to uh, IAO2 meetings, God, I don't know how many, 20, 25 years, whatever the case may be. And there's a gentleman called Ed Landis who gave me a bunch of slides from Aura Tech. So he'll set up the microscope. I don't even know if he's here this weekend. It's always interesting when he takes a little, from dentist sits down, takes a little curricular food, puts it on the microscope, and brings it up, and there's like amoebas and stuff in there. And the word goes out, the entire crowd he, there's amoebas, and I'll show you a picture of it, on this poor dentist. And the poor dentist is there like, sha. Everybody's looking at him. Mm, not good. Not good. Okay. So you can see the difference, you know, with a typical healthy biofilm, you want to call it. It's relatively quiescent to lay there. But as the, the disease, you know, as the ecology changes, and we saw what we call disease state, there's a lot of activity. There's a bunch of psychotics running around there. And you'll start to see some broken down white blood cells, all that things I spoke about before. You know, this is, you know, patient motivation. You know, they kind of they look on the screen and go, oh, my goodness, that's me. And you can repeat that process, you know, as the patient is going through that healing, if you want to call it a healing process itself. So the typical, you know, biofilm is like this. You'll see it under the slide. It's re relatively non multiple not much activity there. You don't really see any white blood cells in the system cell, and you won't see spirochetes themselves. So it's pretty, you know, pretty quiescent, just laying around, everybody's having a good time eating, you know, pooping, doing all the normal things bacteria does. But then as things move along, you start to see some, you know, changes where you'll see some uh, fungus infiltration, and you'll see these different type of fungal forms with mother cells, etc., hyphae, and you'll see these little buds go around. They're not necessarily red blood cells, but they're fungus themselves. Okay, you can see these daughter cells. There we go. 
and you'll see that these yeast forms under the slide itself. And this is when you'll start to see more of the fermentation process and that particular like spirochete breath that comes out when you see these yeast infections. This is where you would check for, you know, uh, root canals going bad and a lot of low grade infection in the oral cavity itself. And this is always fun. This is always, you know, one of our favorite bugs. And uh, it's always fun watching uh, this uh, Trichomonas oralis in somebody else's mouth, by the way. Okay. So it's a protozoan form. And it could be related to Trichomonas vaginalis itself. But, you know, let's not get into that. I'll show you a nice picture of a, a little guy right there. Oh, there you go. Oh, man, I tell you. Look, oh, oh, my goodness. That's in my head? <laughs> help me, help me, please. And you can see the amoebas in there. So if you know anybody like this, you know, uh, make sure you, you stand at arm's length and they don't spit on you. Look at that. This is your head on trichomonas. Look at that. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm telling you how exciting. Oof. If that's in there, where the hell else is everything else? Oof. I think that's when you have to rinse with Clorox or something. Think about that one. So that's one of the nasty little guys that pop up, okay, parasitic forms. And, of course, the famous amoeba. I always ask when we teach our ozone courses, you know, should we be concerned doing in dentistry about parasites? And especially in the United States, people don't think about parasites and parasite infestations too much. Guess what? A lot of people have worms and everything else in the States, okay? So that's something for you to think about tonight when you're having that raw piece of meat. So, you know, protozoan form, you know, we have that little amoeba here. It's often mistaken for white blood cells, but it loves to eat neutrophils. This is their, you know, their favorite meal itself, and it loves to eat red blood, uh, white blood cells themselves. There we go. Oh, now there you go. Now another action shot. Look at that. So the question is, you know, number one, where the hell you get these things? You pick them up, I guess, from your dog. And um, ooh, it's so exciting. So those are the type of things you would look for under your microscope. You see these parasitic forms, and they're tough to get rid of, okay? And I'll explain some tricks. I'll explain how to get rid of these things in a different way, because we're going to think a little bit differently once they get past all this stuff. You know, microbiologic testing, culture testing, antibiotic-specific testing. I don't know how many people really do that, but there's a simple test called the BANA test, very simple. Once again, an assessment tool. It's an enzyme system test that you can do chair side. That gives you a sense of what the... The floral makeup is it's relatively inexpensive and you can get this kit uh, through aura tech itself it's inexpensive and it shows that you know the highest risk of what they call the Saransky's red group and I'll show you that in a second but you know basically you just harvest a little bit of cravicular fluid you rub it on the uh, on this card and it will change you'll you have to cook it up it takes about five minutes Another assessment tool itself. It's sensitive. It's a sensitive DNA testing and a hell of a lot less expensive itself. It's a cheap test, a couple of bucks a test itself. And it's, once again, it's only like three species. All these things are just, you know, even the DNA testing, whether it's root canals, uh, cravicular fluid itself, are very limited to what they can measure. It's a super sliver of reality that what you're growing yourself, but it gives you a possible sense of what goes on. But at this point, does it matter? And I'll show you some tricks on that. So the banner testing itself, it's really as effective as doing all those fantastic uh, DNA testing, which I used to do a bunch of that, but I'll show you why I've backed off those a little bit itself. So you see with the banner testing itself, it will show you these blue markers where you put the curricular fluid on. If they test positive, it will give you a sense of the level or the maturity of the biofilm itself. Once again, simple, positive. It's more for patient reinforcement, patient reinforcement of what's going on itself. I don't want to waste too much time on that. And, you know, this has been, this banner testing, well, I must say, it's been around for quite a period of time, a tremendous amount of research supporting the outcomes on that. Once again, it's a very simple test. It's a very a good assessment, per se. 
It doesn't put a thumb on everything that's going on with the patient itself. Okay, so good, good uh, research behind that. You can become <clears throat> much more advanced. You can do DNA testing, which is very exciting, but much more expensive. Okay, once again, it's going to measure just a few of different type of bacteria that they consider more pathogenic in nature. But the thing that always bugged me about that, and I'll give you some of the advantages of it. You know, it's convenient. You know, it gives multiple species. You know, antibiotic guidance, which I really drives me crazy. And it gives a nice little, you know, very colorful report, and near the costs associated with it. So these are the companies that do that, okay? Uh, MicroIdent Plus, um, My Periopath, Han Testing. You know, very simple. You, you know, once again, paper points, you can do a little cavicular fluid, put it in a tube, ship it off, which is great. Anybody do DNA testing here on uh, Perio? So I don't know about you, but I mean, I like, you know, the report's nice, very colorful. But the problem I have with this Okay, here's the Han testing, very simple. I've been using Han testing for a number of years. But the problem I have with it, I get the same result back every time. No matter what the hell it is, destroy them with antibiotics and antifungals. Am I right? It's the same, you know, it's always the same thing. Okay, so I'm treating a theoretical, localized type of infective state, and I'm blowing, you know, moxicillin, methodiazole, arrest and chlorhexidine in this patient. The same results all the time. Nice assessment, but I don't know if I would follow blasting the patient with all these antibiotics unless you're really in a critical situation itself. So that's the only problem I have with it. Same recommendation time and time and time again. And reproducibility is really a key issue for me. So, you know, with medical life status, the systemic disease, all these different type of things are factors that come into the overall health and wellness of the patient. Are they capable of keeping their mouth clean? What's going on? What kind of pharmaceuticals? Who's seeing a lot of dry mouth syndromes today with the pharmaceuticals? How the hell do you balance that out? You know, these are, these are complex issues. We're fighting a whole pharmaceutical world and, you know, malnutrition world. So it's very complex. As we live longer, the trick is quality of life. And it reflects a lot of time in the oral, oral cavity itself. So all these factors come in as far as con contributing to the patient itself. So in the biologic world, once again, we have to step away from just looking at the teeth and gums and take a look at the patient as a whole, okay? That's really, really important. And once again, you know, you really grow what you are, what you eat, levels of hydration, what you eat, your habits, sleep, supplements, living environment, hygiene, your whole body. So your microflora, okay, is really what you do in life, your reflection of what you do in life. And remember that there are no barriers in the human body. That's for sure. You know, in our school, we teach a lot. We spend a whole day talking about the GI tract. Where does the gut begin? Right here. And where does it end? Well, we certainly know where it ends. Okay. And well, hopefully that's working okay. But it's one thing. It is one thing. It's an amazing system. Okay. Digestion, ingestion, etc. Assimilation all starts in the oral cavity and reflects through all these different, different, you know, environments as you work in your nutrition all the way through. But if you have a gut issues, it's going to reflect up in the oral cavity. Has anybody looked at the concept of tongue diagnosis? I know Chinese methodology, it's amazing what a story it is. You know, in dental school, in dentistry, you know, when we talk about the tongue, you look at the tongue, stick your tongue out, uh, you wrap a piece of blood, uh, uh, yank it around, okay. Take a look at people's tongues a little deeper. Take a look at a different story, look in there. It's a whole story, thousands of years of studies from Chinese medicine, and look at that tongue. There's a whole story there that if we don't look at it, we don't see it. It's a story about this patient, cardiac issues, gut issues, liver. It's all sitting there. These things called homunculuses, okay? Little body forms all over the body that you can read if you have the vision and insight and understand how that is. So the tongue is great, uh, wonderful, but there's a whole story there. Take a look. Get a simple book about tongue diagnosis, and you'll be surprised the correlation when you say patient, big cracks down the middle. Oh, how's your gut doing? Oh, not too good, okay? Red tip of tongue, some cardiac issues. Take a look. There's a story there. The ancient, ancient wisdom 
sometimes we step aside for. So when you talk about how we doing on time, am I still a good boy? It is time for a break. Thank you.